I want to ask questions. Uh, you know, you're doing these little question pop up. Are y'all keeping the data on that? How the questions are answered? Uh, I would have to defer to Monisha for that. I'll do it for I like that, doing that. If you were doing that in the class, see what the reaction, that's what we had on the CAS training up in Baltimore. Uh, you know, seeing what the percentage, how they voted and question they answered. And okay. I, think that, I like that. I think you can get, collect a lot of data that way and get a better knowledge, maybe I should say. Okay. But, Monique, uh, we, I like that. Manish, are we, do we store that data? Is that like collected or does it disappear once we end the class? I think some of it may be in, on the LMS, but I can double check for you all. No, I know that we've at least recorded, I think, all five days. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure where those will be posted after. Maybe Monisha can chime in and talk about where these things go after. <laughs> I don't know yet. Well, I know that we keep them on like in a YouTube channel. Um, I can send a link to um, the whole group at the end of the course. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, Mike, Mike Russo, where, where are you from? Where are you located? I'm down in DC 78 in Orlando, Florida. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. And I know first thing I'll end up doing is uh, implementing this class into a star class. Because I get a big following from industrial painters. Anytime I have a safety class, they come by the truckloads. And uh, so I know they'll attend these classes for PCBs, no doubt about it. Yeah. So just as a side note, Mike, I don't know if you've heard, but I'm a huge Disney fan. So for all your members there that have done an excellent job painting all the rides and stuff I ride, thank you. <laughs> we maybe got beautiful scenic people down here. Yeah. Yes. yes, maybe someday I can actually get back down there. <laughs> yes. Yes, they're opening back up now. They're, they're running around now. So we're so getting our people back out there. You know? um, let's see, just, uh, uh, can I share my screen just for a moment? Cause I want to, uh, I gotta make sure I remember who asked this question. Uh, David, uh, so I wanna, I wanna just get some clarity on this cause it's important. Sometimes the only thing I can do is, is um, show a standard of care, like what other groups are doing to protect people. Like for instance, with heat stress, we don't have a, a, a national heat stress law. Uh, there's some, there's one in California, uh, Washington state has some bits and pieces of heat stress, but as far as protecting workers on a national level, there isn't. So what I have to do, I have to piece together a bunch of different groups, including um, the Navy, like the Department of Navy has heat stress policy for their, uh, you know, their naval, naval personnel. Uh, the Department of Energy has to do stress stuff, uh, MSHA does. Um, because sometimes we have to hold a employer's feet to the fire. And the only way we can do that sometimes is with regulation. So if we try to do it and then the regulations don't actually uh, buttress up what we're trying to do, it could get a sticky situation. Uh, and I wanted to double check to make sure that I was clear about the HASCOM standard. So if we can, I'm gonna share my screen here for a second. What am I doing? Hopefully I can do this. Ah, Safari has come. Good, good. All right, can folks see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is the very beginning of the HASCOM standard. Um, and I'm going to look at the scope and application. So that basically in a, in a, a rule tells us who it applies to, what it applies to, and then how can I apply it? So do, 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 do. Here we get down to 1200 B6. This section does not apply to any hazardous waste. Such term is defined by Solid Waste Disposal Act. Anything under CERCLA, which is what the PCBs are regulated under through the EPA. So that excludes them right now um, as a hazardous, hazardous substance. So the only thing that we've got from OSHA that we can get into is we show the, uh, the PELs. So the way that this has to happen, somehow either an employer has to be a good employer and they've got an industrial hygienist. And I can't tell you how many times I've never seen that <laughs> because it's rare. Um, and also that the person on site's qualified. I, just as a side note, I wrote a, 
um, health and safety site specific plan under the HAZWOPER standard for a uh, construction company that was going to be doing work in San Francisco. And San Francisco's got some very tight standards about um, dust. So construction site dust. Uh, and also they, you know, which is, which is important because you're doing work in a city, if you're going to be causing a lot of dust and it gets off of the site, what's going to happen to the public, right? And people's cars and everything else. So I was going back and forth with this construction company and uh, it turns out they weren't union. And they said, well, why don't you talk to our health and safety expert? I said, oh, good. I'm going to get somewhere because they weren't wanting to do what I suggested they do in the plan, even though it was the law. <laughs> Wasn't me saying this. Come to find out their health and safety expert was a worker that got injured on one of their jobs who broke his back and could no longer work as a construction worker. And I found this out by doing some digging because what this company was telling me, it didn't sound right. So I did some digging. They had a number of OSHA violations. They had this lawsuit and it was this worker that filed the lawsuit. So this worker became their health and safety expert because he got permanently injured. Uh, and disabled from this, this working with this company. No training though, uh, was not a health and safety expert. So imagine if you run into these kinds of scenarios where you've got somebody propped up by a contractor and they don't have the qualifications, right? Would you ask somebody to, let, to weld something that's not a qualified or certified welder? Why would you, you know, wanna hire somebody that's not a qualified health and safety expert? So you might be dealing with somebody that's a health and safety expert, right, uh, for a contractor or an employer, and they might not be that. Um, so you've got to have somebody that's really trained, uh, you know, and, and has an educational background with experience for the work that you're doing that would be able to say, oh, wait a minute, you're going to be taking all this linear feet of caulking out of this building that was built in 1965. I think there might be some PCB issues with that. So you're gonna to have to have somebody who can connect these dots, uh, you know, for your specific job, whatever it is you're doing, and then try to weave together any laws to try to buttress protection of workers. Um, Cause if I only went to HASCOM, I might be like, oh crap, I'm out of luck here. But how would I even know to use the OSHA standard where they only list a permissible exposure limit for PCBs? How would I get to even sampling for workers? I'd have to have the understanding and experience that PCBs might be there and then convince the, the job owner, hey, PCBs might be here, look at my list of evidence. 1965 building, you're, use, you're talking about working with old caulking. This also might be a hazardous waste issue and if you dump it in the wrong spot and somebody finds out, you could be really liable and in trouble. What do you think if we did some sampling and some worker sampling to make sure that not above any level? Because you're working at a school here and you might have somebody drive by and say, that does, I wonder what's going on there. I'm going to call my local Department of Health. And then one thing leads to another. All of a sudden, EPA shows up and OSHA does. That's how it works. So, boss, maybe you might want to, we might want to put these protections in place before we get going. That's what I try to do, right? If I have a law that doesn't help me or no law whatsoever. But you've got to make sure that you've got somebody on your side doing that kind of, of stuff. And in most cases, I've seen, unfortunately, um, it's up to unions, you know, to be able to push this stuff on, this, on the job site. Uh, sorry for the rant there, but I wanted to be clear that, you know, this law helps us with a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it, push, it, it, it removes uh, PCBs or something like lead that was already put on a bridge. It doesn't remove new lead. It does that but it would exclude something that was already put out uh, and used. Um, so uh, anybody have any comments or questions on that uh, information or that, the, you know, the HASCOM law or how this applies to PCBs? It's, I'd like to know why, if they're so concerned about where we're putting a lead, why aren't they uh, concerned about even knowing about if there's PCBs there? God. Well, you just asked me the million dollar question. <laughs> It's politics, it, it, it sucks. Um, again, uh, it would be so expensive for school districts and towns and cities to start to clean all this stuff up and do it the right way. But because it's expensive, does it mean we shouldn't do it the right way? Um, it, it, it's, it's a crappy thing to discuss, right? I, I mean, 
I, I, when I first learned about this, I was dumbfounded that schools do not want to test for PCBs in their buildings. Because once they test it, then the EPA law gets triggered, right? And then they have to do things in a certain way to make sure it's not spread into the public environment. That then also connects to workers doing things the right way. It gets, it's going to be very expensive. Um, we've got a bunch of articles that Wayne and I, um, and when we're doing a discussion, I'll see if I can't pull something up that shows what can happen if you don't do it the right way from the beginning. One of the articles I have is from Washington, DC. The architect of the Capitol was working on, I can't remember what building it was, but it was a building, you know, going along doing their work. All of a sudden they found PCBs and I can't remember how they determined that they had it. Job stopped and I think it was an extra $100,000 that got added to the job in an extra four months um, because they didn't do it the right way to begin with. Right. So it, it's expensive, but this is the same thing like with coronavirus. If we just do it the right way now, it's going to be less expensive later. If you plan for PCBs up front and you do the job uh, to abate them properly up front, it's going to cost you a lot less money as a job owner down the road. That's just how it goes, right? Just like, you know, just like your health. You know, if you take care of your health up front, it's going to be some time, might be some money, but if something bad happens to you down the road, it's going to be more time, more money, and God forbid, you know, you might not be here anymore. Um, so that's why, um, you know, Dave, I, I, I don't have any other better explanation unless somebody else can offer something. Well, the other thing I'll, I'll say, Bernie, is where it's not required to be tested, contractors go to their out, asbestos and lead or whatever else. And so it's not a prevalent test by any means. And plus, how many millions, hundreds of millions of pounds did they say there was? I think, you know, Monsanto and all of them are trying to keep this as a deep, dark secret. Yes, action lawsuits against them, right? Yeah. Look how long the asbestos has lasted, guys. It's lasted a long time, hasn't it? It'll last a lot longer, too. Oh. Yep. Yeah. I was looking at that thing. They got PCB and cosmetic, you know, that women use. It's in that too. Yeah, there's some countries that actually uses it for beauty products and cooking oil too, Rick. Yeah, I know the cooking oil, but that just direct deposit right on your skin. I mean, what do you, you think know, the you cooking oil is doing to them? Yeah, it's contaminating all, all them chickens and frogs and stuff they're cooking over. Yeah. And the roaches and the everything else. Take it one yeah. step further. We found out that it's in clothing dye. You're probably wearing some right now. Yeah. Take it off. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't take it off, Easton. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, um, I looked this up. I'm going to uh, share my screen again here. Let's see. Share screen, share screen. All right, can everybody see this okay? Final price tag unknown for Cannon House office building. Can folks see this? Yep. So yes. Actually, I, I misquoted the number. I was a little off. I said 100,000, it's 100 million. Oh, wow. A little? Oops. Uh, that's why I liked to double check my numbers before I say something. But I did say in my defense, I can't remember. Look at that, sign me up for Congress. Um, so this article, what I did, if you wanna uh, you know, look at it, uh, final price tag unknown for Canon uh, uh, house office building renovation. As best as PCBs among the hazardous materials found in the project. So they started this and then they found this stuff. Um, and you know, that's obviously a very public space, right? Uh, it's it's surrounded by many other buildings in D.C. Um, you know, so it gets down to, you know, the article goes through about how it occurred, how they found it, what they decided to do to stop. Um, we understand that in working with a 110-year-old building, we might encounter hazardous materials. However, the scope and type could only be known upon beginning the work on the building. Uh, so here's the issue is if you don't have a knowledgeable uh, planning group 
you might not look at this stuff to begin with. And that's why, you know, a planning group or any project, it doesn't matter if you're in a, in a factory building something new, planning a new process uh, or doing a construction job. It's a good idea to include workers on in the ground floor because workers know the work best. A worker knows the work better than an architect. They might not be, they're just as valuable. They have different skills though, right? Different education, different backgrounds, different abilities to help that project be completed. Um, but how many times do workers actually get to participate in things like this, right? It's usually like a, a representative from a, a general contractor or a subcontractor goes, whether or not they actually got work experience or not, you know, who knows. Um, but, you know, it, it specifically mentions the EPA, uh, the PCBs during this article. So that, that, that's a big issue. And there's a lot of articles like that. Um, that you can bring up if you, you know, Google the right uh, group of words for PCBs. So it shows you what the issues are, you know, uh, and it, if you don't plan for it and they find, get found out after, it's going to be very expensive. Not to mention, uh, if I was a worker working on that job and I was on there for six months, I would be pretty pissed off that my employer <laughs> just exposed me to PCBs and asbestos and they didn't know about it, right? Um, I've heard they use dogs to find mercury in, in schools. I'm no kidding. Yeah, a dog, uh, I haven't heard about that, but it's interesting. I wouldn't doubt it. Their, their, their schnozzes are, uh, was it a hundred times more sensitive than ours? Yep. My dog always knows when I open up a can of sardines. <laughs> well, so does the rest of my family, but I guess. Uh, any other uh, discussions about, you know, moving this kind of class forward and what it means for IUPAT members? Uh, I have a question. Uh, there is any article that shows the, the highest PCB level on, on people? Anybody ever die of PCB? I mean, the high level? Because people are actually eating in other countries, so it must be something. So, um, is that I like that? I didn't look for this specifically. That's a good question, but we could certainly find something like that, you know, and maybe implement it in this class during the first or second, or maybe the second uh, uh, module when we talk about toxicology and uh, environmental aspects. People have died from PCB related diseases, but as we discussed on uh, that second day, um, it's up to the medical examiner to kind of connect the dots, right? Because an epidemiologist, the folks that study diseases and populations, they can only work with the data that they have. So if the data is misrepresented, you know, the example I gave was somebody fell off a ladder in the desert uh, out in Hanford, Washington, struck their head. And luckily, you know, again, not luckily for this worker, but luckily for all other workers to come after, the medical examiner classified it as a death due to heat stress, um, not striking the head. Uh, so if you've got somebody that oh. looks at the pathological reason for Allergy for why the person died. If they don't connect the dots that it was a disease due to PCBs, that that's missed, and so that harms the rest of the population that's alive because we're not going to know, right, how to protect yourself or why. So that's a good that's a good question, um, and we can certainly look to something and put you know maybe add a slide into the uh, the second module. Yeah, I yeah. think that's a great statement yeah. for the simple reason it, it's you know the EPA's put it out there, don't eat the fish, it harms wildlife and everything else, but they haven't done or released any studies on what it has, or I said, they, let me rephrase that. The, they have given us the information about wildlife and fish and things like that, but they haven't followed up to tell the whole story of what it's doing to us. Yeah. Right. It seems like they care more about the eagles than, than actually human beings. Yeah, and the big problem with all of them guys is none of the government agencies work together. They're always fighting against each other. Have y'all noticed that here lately with the COVID? Jeez. Yep. Yeah, and um, it's it's look. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make this up. It's expensive to protect workers, Without but I don't think we're work we're worth it, <laughs> right? Um. You know, another example, when, when Wayne and I 
uh, and Jim were putting together uh, the worker class, you know, we were looking up some examples in the news. So it might not have been the worker class. It might have been when we did that uh, FIF presentation. Um, up here in Massachusetts, there is the Merrimack River, which leads into uh, Newburyport, Massachusetts, and out to the ocean. There's going to be like a, a bicycle walking path, and they had to close it down uh, because they found PCB contamination in the soil along where the path was being either being created or, or already was created. But it was such a concern about people, you know, getting off the path and just touching this contaminated soil, they had to close it down to be cleaned up because it can transfer through your skin. Um, and in fact, in the pocket guide, who stole my pocket guide? Oh, it's a widget. Ah, home office has gotten a little bit crazy since, uh, all right, so we got to look up, what is it, dichloro, what the hell do they call it? Dichloro something, right? Dichloroacetylene, no. Dichloroethylene, no. Dichloroethyl ether. Just a second, folks. This is why I wish we were in a, a regular class. It's more interesting when the instructor looks up something in front of an actual live class as opposed to online, <laughs> is it? Well, while uh, Bernie's looking that up, guys, for the guys that live up in the Northeast in Maine, New Hampshire, the Merrimack River is the main water source for Budweiser in Merrimack, New Hampshire, but that's north of where he's talking, so we're good. <laughs> I, I was looking at the White House. The White House was built on the 700s. So the, the White House must be full of PCBs on it. You're right, Tiago, because we had a contractor up here that was actually, the Olsen Company was bid on the Capitol Dome a few years back. And they didn't find PCBs because they didn't test for it but the lead was so highly concentrated that they couldn't use it as recycling. They couldn't recycle the materials because it was so contaminated. So they had to bring new, new materials in every day for the, for the blasting part. Wow. <laughs> What'd that cost? Uh, All right. Nobody seems to know. I think it was a blank check. <laughs> <laughs> That was just an excellent example of another instructor jumping in to save another instructor while they were looking to find something. Thank you, Wayne. You're welcome. When we actually get to get <laughs> together again, I'll, I'll buy you a beer. Um, Not both wise it though. Yeah, right. you got to remember, it's going to take more than 20, too. Right, that's right, that's right. 21. Uh, so so for, both 42% and 54% um, PCBs. And again, OSHA uses chloro diphenyl. Um, it's actually got a skin exposure limit too. So there's a skin notation. So if this stuff is in your soil or worse for a worker, if this stuff's in the caulking and you're just grabbing it off of your hands, it is going to get into your body through your skin and it is going to damage the skin, right? So that's, if it's in the soil, if there's kids around, stuff like that, that's very concerning. Um, uh, don't forget about the last of too, guys. Mm. It's in all, all the last Americs that I have found. So what are you talking about, Jim, like gaskets and stuff like that? No, this is actually a concrete coating to coat concrete or roofs. Oh. It's, and especially down in Florida on the exterior of the buildings, they use a lot, a lot of that last of Americs. And, and, and remember when we, what we talked about yesterday, and when you actually go to test for cleanliness after you've abated this stuff, they're gonna to have to go in and do them core samples. And it's two inches deep, it's what the EPA wants. Yeah. Now, this you, question, go ahead, Barney. I was just gonna say, um, so that the last uh coating you're talking about, is this stuff that IOPAT members work oh, with? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. we put it on everywhere. Okay. Yeah, from, so the, from swimming pool paints, uh, right through <laughs> to the exterior buildings. I'm so, wondering if the DTMs are even full of it, Wayne. They very well could be. The old DTMs that we used to have from Sherman Williams and Diamond Vogel and a few of the others, I bet that stuff was loaded. Yeah. 
We're this one calls it a plasticizer, it's in it. Yeah. Okay. ETM is probably one of their main products that they do on commercialized and industrial. I use so much of it out there at the paper mill. I can't tell you how many thousands of gallons I put on. But uh, you know, the you know, stop the respirator either. <laughs> you know, they put it on the water tanks too, guys, on the exteriors of the water tanks, the series twenties and stuff, to Nemics. Some of that stuff was pretty nasty. Um, you know what would be useful um, going forward, and, and again, we can probably use the instructor lounge for this, or I mean, you could just email stuff to, to Wayne, uh, Jim and myself directly too. If you can think of uh, any historic product that an IUPAT member might have used, like by trade name or something like that, and email it to us, that would be good because then we could start to collect a, like a database of some of these products and educate you know the IPAT membership not just through this class but the worker class so we could even put a fact sheet out about it hell i mean we could even write an article about it and put it in you know the IPAT trade uh, magazine um Thanks, for it, you know and it's obviously not going to include everything because we learned that you know it was you know thousands of products but just some stuff to get people to recognize this and connect in their mind that they might be working around it so you know over the next month or so uh, if you find anything like that, if you remember anything, email it to us or throw it in the instructor lounge. And then we can look it up from there. You know, and I can do some historical research on the, on the trade name product and, and find more information on it. Probably go to the guys that make the paint, the paint makers. Yeah, I bet you they get a lot of doses of it. Yeah, I mean, you, you, we, we, we could. I don't know if I'd be able to get anybody to talk to me directly. Well, I know <laughs> we do, we do cover them through the nation. BLP okay. had the powder that Mick came down. With. Uh, he worked in it for years, and they found out that the product that they were using causes cancer, which is brain cancer. And he was a paint maker out here, Mobile Paint, called BLP. Uh, they're still in business making paint, and one of the lawyers got a hold of it and uh, pursuing it, but. That might be something we could look at with Sheriff Williams. I know up in Cleveland, I'm pretty sure they're still union up there. Mm -hmm. And is that one in Nashville? No. Uh, Memphis, they still in business there to make uh, street markers? I know they've got to be using lead. Well, they used to have them. And our district council, they do search. Yeah, we got them in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, and then also in Memphis. So, Wayne, didn't we yeah. do an article for Paint Square back three, four years ago? It, uh, did it ever go anywhere? Did Not we that ever I hear know, anything? I don't remember much response from it, but I do remember that when uh, me, you, Gavin, and Dan put something together. We do have an article to put in Paint Square right now, Bernie. All right, well, let's, let's um, if you can send it to me, let's, let's get this thing brought back up. I'll we, have to find it. <laughs> and since we're sort of launching the PCB class with this train the trainer um, and what we're doing going forward, I think it'll be a good good idea. Um, well, what I want to do is I want to just move to show a couple of the other items that are uh, included with this class for instructors. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll share my screen again here. And a quick question. You think it's possible to be on the gas suit, the gasoline? I don't think so, no. All right, so this here is, um, this is for instructors. This is a short instructor's notes uh, brief. I can't remember what it is, three pages, five pages. It basically talks about what the class is, right? The goals of the class. Uh, very, it's not going to qualify any, any worker who takes it to go and abate PCB, so we don't want to give that impression. It talks about how the course is broken into the four different sections or modules. Of course, background and key points to understand as the instructor. Uh, it's got a section on course delivery and classroom management. 
Now I, I wrote this pre-COVID, so um, you know maybe I should add to this uh, note to self about online. So I'm going to add a paragraph to this. Or so talks about allocated time, you know, module delivery. Then these are materials that you'll need to teach the class and to be comfortable and confident. So, you know, the actual course agenda, uh, the student manual. Um, which I believe is just going to be a printout of, you know, the, the notes, um, the slides, you know, three per page or something like that. Uh, the awareness activities that will either be contained, uh, you know, contained in the manual or just separately. Uh, the fact sheet packet, uh, awareness instructor manual, the assertion evidence PowerPoint presentation, so the thing that we went through, and uh, an awareness test, and I'm not sure you know, if, if this is going to stay in or not. And then obviously the, the hard stuff that you need to teach, you know, like a screen, that kind of thing. Uh, an example of a PCB case study applicable to members. So, you know, we'll provide a generic one, but if you've got something specific to the area, your local uh, district council area that you are teaching it in, if you could find something like that, it would be better for your students, right? Because it's right in their backyard. Um, you don't want to get a cop, uh, you know, copy of the pocket guide, a couple per group, the ACJH TLV booklet, a couple per group, and then the, the EPA 40 regulation, uh, 7761, a couple per group. And then some just other, the, you know, the training materials that we talk about and that we've used. Uh, group discussions and activities. So it talks about how you want to set these up and what you want to get out of them. And then where to go for more information. And then I'll show the next one that we got. Oh. Sorry, folks, that's the same one. All right. So this one here is the the uh, instructor's handouts. It's uh it's it's pretty long, because what it does is it's got a copy of every slide. And I just remembered we we updated the format, so I'm gonna have to go. We're gonna have to go back and put the new slides in here. Um, but what it is, it's got each slide, and it's got the trainer's notes for each slide. So depending upon how you want to you know teach, what your style is. Um, you know, you can have this as a paper copy next to you, uh, if you'd like. Um, you know, it's got plenty of spots to write your own stuff down. And what it does, it just goes through everything we got. So it's the whole entire awareness a class, um, you know, where there are notes, there's notes there for you, etc. So there's those two items. Uh, and then there's a couple of other items that we have included for that instructor packet, like the, uh, the EPA regulation. You know things like that. Uh, so that's about everything that encompasses the course uh, that you would get to be able to teach the awareness class. Um, you know, I you can teach it by yourself, but I'm always a proponent of team teaching and stuff like that. It's nice if you've got two instructors. Um, you know, I know that um, the, is it the FTI, IFTI, whatever whatever the organization is that I'm now a part of for the educational part. Uh, we're trying to do some cross-regional teaching initiatives because since we can use Zoom during this COVID uh, pandemic, so like, for example, the infectious disease COVID-19 in ICRA class that we developed, they're doing cross-regional training where you've got, you know, trainers from different regions of the country in Canada working together to put a class on. Uh, and this is something I think that we could add to that too, right? So you could get together um, and teach this from different areas of the country at the same time. It, it would be nice. And, you know, to have two teachers do it together. Uh, Wayne and Jim, anything to add? Anything I missed? No, but I'm just, I think this would be a good uh, part to open it up to you guys. I have a couple of questions for you. Was there any sections that we, that you felt that we lost you in? or do we need to emphasize any more points or you know i'm open up for discussion i mean got my big boy pants on you're not going to hurt my feelings if there's something that 
you felt we lost you on or we need to spend more time on? Well, let me ask you something about the testing. Um, you, you said that uh, methods uh, 9079 was for uh, transformer oils. And then you had method 9078 for soil. Uh, the 9079, does that do both bulk and liquid, that test? No, well, let me get to the page here. Or was there another one for liquid and another one for bulk, and then there was a soil one? Yeah, so the, the 9079 is for transformer oil only, and the 9078 is for soil only. Uh, there would be, I don't know if that would be, so the, the soil basically would be bulk waste, you know, because you would have the soil and whatever contamination, okay, paint, et cetera, might be mixed in with that, or okay. oil that dripped in with that. If you're looking at doing transformer oil only, you know, you oh. need that one. Uh, as, as opposed to that, what they would do for, you know, taking the core samples, I would have to look that one up. Okay, yeah, because if we're testing caulking or something, that would, I would assume that'd be different than doing the soil. So, okay. Uh, and then uh, another one, were they putting BC, P, uh, PCBs into the safety data sheets years ago? Were they adding it in there for that? Or this is, start, now they're putting PCBs in the safety data sheets now? Uh, in products, you know? So they have, so they have to now. So if there's, if it's in the product now, they have to. Okay, so they're just starting to do that now. But years ago, they did not. Uh, well, they oh, did, no. but remember, they were under different trade names. Right. Okay. And uh, you know, I think the Hascom standard. I can't remember when it was promulgated. I don't know if it was '78 or '84, somewhere around there. But you might have missed um, a lot of products. Right. And we all know the joke about material safety data sheets. They were terrible. Right. Half of them had missing information. The other half had incorrect information that was on there. So going back and trying to find historical stuff, we can try, uh, but it might be a, a, a dead end. And also to remember they had, um, gosh, I haven't had to refer to it now for so long because we had GHS on the book since 2012. Um, there was a percentage where you would not have to report carcinogens. Right. And back then, uh, PCBs was not carcin uh, considered a carcinogen. Okay. Well, Bernie, I want to take it also. Would you refer to uh, asbestos as nat natural mineral fiber now? So they got their industry yeah. has their <laughs> ways of disguising <laughs> the bad stuff. Wording. Right. Got any questions, Dave? Like they're playing politics with people, you know. <laughs> oh. So I guess, guys, what'd you think of the presentation? Did you like it? Do you think it's worth worth the rollout? I think it's a good yeah. start to get the information out. I still like that idea that asking those questions and seeing what the percenters and keeping the data and also maybe a questionnaire and when the, uh, probably mostly apprentices and the gentlemen when you do put on a class, questionnaires and collecting that data, maybe job sites uh, specific, maybe we'll be able to come up with better ideas, I should say, or better data on where our guys are actually working. And I know it's here, some of them got more commercial and industrial, my area is more industrial than commercial. Uh, if we can maybe collect some data that way, it's a start and keeping up with information. I don't know what I think about it, but it might be a start. Yeah. And the other thing I'm going to throw out there too, Rick, where you're out talking with contractors and everything every day is maybe even open up a conversation, ask if they're seeing any bid forms or bid documents coming out that may under the hazardous material part, seeing if it, they're specifying PCBs. Right. And that's what I was talking about, like going to the EPA and getting to the DOT, coal engineer, 
make them now more aware of what they really, they can't know about it. There's a few very limited people that know about it. And that's another, you were right, I, I like that. <clears throat> How about you, Lambert? I'm allergic to PCBs. <laughs> I think we're gonna have to get some uh, uh, legislation passed first before they do anything, aren't they? Unfortunately. So, I mean, why are they even gonna bother testing for it if they don't have to? I mean, well, yeah. The more people you get screaming about it, that's where yeah, it's that. There's like three or four different regions of the country here now. Well, at least, what, the Midwest, South, and the East, and the Mid-Atlantic. I mean, yeah. this might open up the conversation that you might want to have with somebody, with your political people within your own district councils, and let them know what's going on. Maybe they can bend somebody's ear. Right. Yeah, even if you could pass one uh, locally or state or any start. Yeah, then you could force them into <clears throat> Probably bottom up to the top down. Yeah. So when they when they first started talking about these PCBs, it seems like it was a big deal, and then all of a sudden, they, everybody it, it went away because the eagle got scared. We'll check on those M and M peanuts. Get those in it. I eat a lot of them. It all come down to where nobody's making money off of it yet. Nobody wants to spend that money to actually take care of it. Yeah, that's how you have to force it them into it. It a lawsuit, probably. I, mean, I just read uh, PubMed of a site in Indiana where they make these uh, like transformers and they're coming down with brain cancer. So I just read that same thing. Um, Med, M -E -D .com. You know, if you get up in Wayne's area and even in our area, Rick, look, how old are the schools? 500 years. You know, this little town I'm from right here, the school was built back in the late 40s, early 50s, and they just tore, demoed the buildings down without testing anything. What do you think that dust done? Demos always to work. Yeah. How many people are dying from 9-11? There's still people dying from it. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You know, every day you see on the news, the guys are massive down here, and they had a little tape running across there. I always tell my students, I, why would you want to go over there and talk to them? <laughs> got a mask on, and that's the invisible line right there, and that's going to stop it. I tell them, don't go over there. The PCBs uh, way worse than the lead and asbestos. Now that I'm, I'm more aware of it, absorbing through your skin and more than your PCBs. It's something you need to look at too. This is an awareness class, right. so basically we're going to get them aware of it. Bernie's already done finished the workers' course pretty close, hadn't you, Bernie? Yep. And once we get this under their belts, if we turn around and start doing a workers' course for our guys. It's even going to educate them even more because you're going to get more in depth in all the processes. Right. And what do you do? How are you going to test it? So it's going to make it a lot better. At least to know that, hey, I don't want to do that. They ain't going to give me the proper PPE. Uh, so okay. it's going to. It, it's, I was talking. It's going to come down, Rick. To it's. It's coming down to where we got to get our political guys to talk to the people in Congress and the Senate and uh, the people that uh, needs to hear this. And we're going to have to make it and push it ourselves to keep them going. And, and like me and Wayne was talking, we wrote a blog to put on Paint Square. I don't think it ever got on Paint Square, did it, Wayne? I think it did, but I don't know for sure, Jim. I was. I was on the impression it went. I never did hear if it did or not, but we've got to push it in all avenues. We've got to start protecting our people. 
I got a buddy I played golf with. He worked for waste management. He's the guy in the middle that gets all this hazard of waste. I'm not going to tell him what I'm doing, but I'm going to find out how educated he is on it. And I don't know about it. I him all the time, but I'm going to test him on it, see what he knows. Before I forget, folks, I want to get uh, to answering Mike's question about the uh, the PCB transformer and soil test. So let me just give you a brief example of, of what these, um, how you find these things. So I'm going to share my screen again here for a second. All right, so this here is the, the EPA SW846 compendium of sampling criteria. And this includes sampling for a bunch of different things, a bunch of different ways. So both of those tests on the slide were under the 846 compendium. One was for transformer oil, one was for uh, soil, uh, but the one that we'd want to find if you were testing for caulking or bulk waste would be different. But just as an example, it was 846, what was it, 9,000 something? So what I would do is here are the different series of tests. That one for the oil, transformer oil and soil was in the series 9,000. Here we go. So it was 9,078 screening for a PCBs in soil and 9,079 uh, screening for PCBs in transformer oil. So they have, um, you know, the test for bulk waste here for chlorinated products as well. So, you know, I could take one of those and add it to the slide too. Um, and then there's other methods for doing the sampling. Again, this is, you know, the worker class, but you can do wipe samples if it's a non-porous surface. If it's porous, Jim already mentioned, you got to, you know, dig in two to five centimeters, you know, to make sure that you can get enough of that stuff that might have absorbed the PCB oil. Does that help, Mike? Yeah. Okay. Points me in the right direction, at least, you know. All right, uh, Jim and Wayne, uh, anything else we need to cover or uh, discuss before we close out? No, well, I think we pretty much nailed everything. And, uh, you know, I think the guys have given us a lot of feedback. So that's a big help. I think you did a good job for, for starting. Uh, I got a good awareness of it. I really do think it's going to be helpful. So y'all did a good job. And keep it up. Thank you. Yeah, and again, you know, if you're teaching it online like this, um, Wayne, Jim, I myself were talking about it this morning. It's possible you could combine, you know, some of it into, you know, I don't know, a four hour day and give a break in between and stuff, but it's probably better just to keep it like it was, you know, uh, if you're just doing the awareness for two hour days, if you only run an hour and a half because you got a smaller class and because it's online, I, you know, it's probably better than trying to have somebody sit through a, you know, a four hour planned session, even if you only make it three hours. Uh, if this was on uh, in person, you know, with a lunch and some breaks, um, even with, with 11 folks like we had, you'd probably be finishing up around seven hours or so. If you have a bigger class, you know, it'd probably stretch it closer to the eight hour mark. All right, anybody have any uh, parting comments or questions?